Hello and welcome to The Pulse. Later in the show, the territory-wide system assessment was designed to test the ability of schools rather than individual primary school students. So why is it exerting so much stress on students to the extent that they are, as one former school principal says, becoming like Foxconn workers? We'll also be looking at Myanmar's first openly contested general election in 25 years. But first, last week the Legislative Council's Finance Committee dominated by pro-government legislators, approved a long-cherished and much-delayed initiative of Chief Executive Lan Chung Ying, the Innovation and Technology Bureau. Last Friday, after months of discussion, the Legislative Council Finance Committee approved funding for setting up the Innovation and Technology Bureau. It's a much-cherished initiative of Chief Executive Lan Chung Ying, who first floated the idea in his 2012 election manifesto. Five Pan-Democrats' continuing attempts to filibuster the debate had tabled over 1,000 motions challenging the proposal. To block their strategy, the committee's chairman Chen Kim Po slashed the number of motions to just over 100. <laughs> The Innovation and Technology Bureau will be set up within the next week. One of its tasks is to liaise with stakeholders, including the Hong Kong Science Park, to boost local IT development. Under the IT Bureau will be the Innovation and Technology Commission and the Office of the Chief Information Officer, both of which are currently part of the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau. I encourage overlap, I encourage uh, you know, cross-sectoral kind of development. Uh, say in startups. Uh, there are innovation uh, in terms of technology innovation as well as design innovation. So there will be overlap in terms of say even startups. Um, but you know as in the past the gov government uh, inter-bureau cooperation is seamless. So I have no concern about that. Some of the opposition to the bureau has come about because pan-democrats see it as a political reward for a long-time Leung Chenying ally, executive counselor Nicholas Young, who is tipped to be his first head. For his part, the Taiwan-born businessman stresses that even if the new secretary is nominated by the chief executive, he also needs to be formally appointed by the central government. I believe the government is very experienced in setting up any new bureau or new department in the past. So such, such statutory process is pretty much built into the system. So we should have confidence uh, in a smooth transition from the government. Well, with us in the studio are Charles Mock, legislator for the Innovation and Technology Functional Constituency, and Jimmy Wong, member of Frontline Tech Workers, which opposes the setting up of the Bureau. Can, can I come to you, Charles Mock? Yes. You're in favour of the setting up of the Bureau. What, why does Hong Kong need such a thing? Well, for one thing, we did have a bureau, IT and Broadcasting Bureau, back uh, uh, right after the handover in 2002. And we did see at the time that a lot of the technology-related policies were made and done much quicker than they had, uh, than, than, than after the bureau was actually disbanded. So in a way, we we're just going back to a, uh, a, uh, a structure that worked better before. But I think the mo the, another aspect is also because the, uh, uh, we did see that one of the problems with the uh, advent of in innovation and technology issues in Hong Kong is that uh, we lack court government high-level coordination. And we did believe that uh, having a secretary and a bureau would make that easier among the different bureaus in the government. Well, Jimmy Wong, you're, you're, you're opposed to this. Um, basically, why? Uh, let, me, let me clarify. We are not completely opposed uh, uh, the establishment of ITB. What we oppose is uh, establishing, or uh, the, as the government says, re-establishing ITB uh, without some prior conditions, such as uh, a thorough review of current uh, innovation and technology policies, uh, define a set of uh, metrics and uh, key performance indicators, such that when a government um, come up with new policies, they have something to base on, right? They can look at a couple of numbers and say, you know, which policy uh, moved the needle by how much, and then they can adjust accordingly. Uh, the government have refused to do that, and uh, so far, 
um, we haven't seen an, a, a clear vision coming out of the proposal as well. So, uh, so that's one point. Another point is, uh, in our opinion, looking at the current um, structure of the ITB, which basically just consists of OGCIO, the uh, Office of Government yeah, Chief right. Information Officer, right. Okay. Right, 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 and yeah. the uh, Innovation and, and Technology, innovation uh, and technology, and technology, and technology, and technology Commission. Commission, right? Um, so it's too small for a lot of things to be done, and uh, the ITB. Uh, and Innovation Technology Bureau is too low a level, in my opinion. You know, this sounds yeah. suspiciously to yeah. me like you actually want far more government intervention in the information technology industry. Is that right? Uh, our members actually, uh, well, are divided into like two sectors, <laughs> right? You know, some of us uh, really don't want it, and some of us uh, think that, you know, it sh probably should be a higher level up because uh, the ITB, it's about the same level as other uh, government bureaus, right? So one of the stated goals of ITB is to be able to coordinate uh, multiple government agencies and bureaus to come up with um, you know, better solutions for technical problems, right? But if you, are, you know, have the exact same standing as other bureaus, how do you coordinate? Well, yeah. I, I think actually uh, I do agree with uh, Jimmy on the fact that the government didn't give us any uh, uh, clear proposal about exactly what they're going to do with the Bureau and uh, they didn't set up the metrics which are both very disappointing. Uh, but I also think that uh, the government uh, right now, uh, the way that they are handling the whole uh, establishment of the Bureau, you know, before, you know, for the last year for example, uh, when we were uh, uh, discussing it in the Finance Committee, unfortunately the whole thing had been turned into a political exercise by the Chief Executive. Because, it, uh, you know, first of all, in February and July, he tried to get it past the Finance Committee, which when actually there, it was impossible. If anybody knew about the rules and how things work in the Finance Committee, you know that adding 20 hours at the end of the last week of a, before a particular deadline, you're just not going to get it passed. But the purpose was actually a political exercise. And my biggest uh, disappointment was that uh, the government and the chief executive in particular tried to use the establishment of uh, the ITB as a political tool. But isn't there a more fundamental question? Is, is a, it may even be a philosophical question, you know, why does Hong Kong really need a bureau to mm. do what the high-tech industries themselves can't do for themselves? You know, did you need a bureau in America to set up Facebook, to set up Microsoft? Well, you could, you could compare us with some of the countries that do not have a similar bureau. But you could also compare us with many of the countries around us that have such a bureau. I mean, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, the, uh, China, uh, Malaysia, And Philippines. what do they do? The, they, the they, I, I think what they do is provide... Uh, they're, they're, you mentioned about a government intervention. Uh, I mean, to me, it's about government support and hopefully correcting some of the issues, some of the things that the government isn't doing right at the moment. Well, Jimmy Wong, I mean, you're also in the high-tech industry. What is it that, that is lacking at the moment that needs to be there? One of the things that is quite lacking is a uh, is government vision, we think, uh, such a, and, and, and a, um, an insight into current technology trends. Uh, we've seen in the past couple of days that, you know, um, they, they actually have uh, been talking about to MIT for quite some time and now the MIT has set up an innovation center in Hong Kong. So that only further proves that, you know, if you really wanted to get something done, you don't need to have a, government, a new government bureaucracy, right? You can get something done right now. So, well, yeah. Jimmy Wong, Charles Mock, thank you very much indeed. And we'll be back after the break. Welcome back. The Territory-Wide System Assessment, or TSA, was not designed to do this, but has ended up putting a great deal of pressure on primary school children who are subjected to the tests at both primary three and primary six level. Schools push their students hard to perform well to ensure that the school's reputation remains intact. Parents and educators have formed a concern group and issued an open letter to the Secretary for Education, Eddie Ng, asking the government to reduce 
the TSA's negative impact on children. They've also taken to social media. As of this week, some 69,000 people, many of them parents of young school children, had joined a Facebook page urging the Education Bureau to abolish the TSA test for primary three and primary six students. When the Bureau first introduced the TSA for primary three and primary six students, it claimed that extra drills for students would not be necessary because the assessment subjects, including Chinese, English and mathematics, would have been covered in regular classes. This is not how things turned out. One primary school teacher told The Pulse that it's very common for students to be intensively drilled for the TSA test on top of their usual homework and is beyond the level of most primary three students. Not just that. When teachers are drafting school quiz and exam papers, they're told by headmasters that the style has to be very similar to or even exactly the same as that of the TSA assessment papers. In other words, they become part of the preparation for TSA tests. a recent survey by the Baptist Oikwan Social Services and the Hong Kong Education Institute found that around a third of primary three and primary six students are suffering anxiety or emotional breakdown due to being overloaded with homework and TSA drills. Public and subsidised primary schools have no choice but to comply. Private schools have the privilege to say no. After increased pressure from parents, private schools, First Assembly of God Primary School and Kaoyan School have announced that they will be stopping taking part in the Primary 3 TSA test. They will continue with the Primary 6 test. Rita Ching, who runs a social enterprise education centre in Shamshoipo, has personal experience of the negative impact of the TSA. She says the TSA contradicts the true meaning of education and now provides teaching and counselling to help young children ease stress. On Wednesday this week, Fung Pit Yi, the headmistress of the Aplei Chao Kai Fong Primary School, took teachers on a community trip to Aberdeen. She said that as her school does not encourage TSA drills, her teachers have more time for such activities, which really help students. But this measure of freedom has not come easily. Both Ms Fung and the school council have to resist considerable government pressure. Ha 就是,那些霸團裡面有一些學校。根據我們教育局的資料,你學校的學校的TSA成績不是很好。我想你們的霸團體應該跟學校去傾下。怎樣去提升你們屬下霸團體的學校的TSA成績。At a recent legislative council meeting, Eddie Ng resorted to the not-so-rare government strategy of setting up a committee. It will, he said, review issues regarding TSA, including whether schools have over-drilled students. 
He says the Bureau has no intention of abolishing this assessment, but that he is willing to listen to parental concerns. There will be a public hearing on the TSA at the end of this month. Legislators ask him whether he would take the opportunity to talk to parents face to face. He said he'd be busy. Last Sunday's general election in Myanmar is in some ways a repeat of the stunning victory achieved in 1990 by the opposition National League for Democracy led by Aung San Suu Kyi. However, this time it seems that the people's mandate will be honoured by the successors of the military junta who overruled that election with a reign of oppression. About 30 million people were eligible to vote, with a turnout estimated at about 80%. Missing were hundreds of thousands of Muslim Rohingya people, classified by Myanmar as stateless Bengali Muslims from Bangladesh. Most are denied citizenship and have no right to vote, and incidentally have also been ignored by the victorious NLD. We found that the process for candidate nominations and the verification of candidacies was applied in a way that, as a result, had a very, very low number of Muslim candidates remaining. We also believe that for the future, the parties would be well advised to increase the participation of women in the political life of the country. On Friday, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League for Democracy, won a landslide victory and claimed a majority in parliament. Its people have voted for an end to military dictatorship. The National League for Democracy is expected to form the next government and reshape the political landscape in Myanmar. President Tien Sen has promised that the election results will be honoured. However, Suu Kyi, leader of the victorious party, cannot become president because the military regime amended the constitution to bar anyone with foreign children from leading the nation. Suu Kyi has two foreign sons. She has, however, stated that she will be above the president in running the country. I make all the decisions because I'm the leader of the winning party and the president will be one whom we will choose just in order to meet the requirements of the Constitution. There are many complaints about this, including within her own party, that she's been uh, very high-handed, uh, that she's not taken a lot of advice, um, that she's very much her own boss, um, and that she keeps the focus on herself. So, and she's not uh, really produced much in the way of a manifesto or series of policies that can appeal to the electorate. Uh, she has overlooked a great many party stalwarts when selecting candidates. Um, it does seem that uh, she's pretty much content, or insists on even, um, calling the shots um, within that party. Regarding the reaction of the people, I would say um, the reaction has changed quite a lot. When you compare, let's say, five years ago, when I talked to the people in, um, on the street in Yangon, people still see Aung San Suu Kyi as a sacred person, as a holy mother of Burma. But right now, a lot more people will see Aung San Suu Kyi as a politician instead of a holy martyr of Burma. Though the NLD has won the landmark election, the army still retains substantial power, and that will make it hard to amend the constitution, enabling Suu Kyi to become the president. The democracy itself will not uh, be consolidated. Uh, the military will not give up power. Uh, democratic consolidation means that democracy is the only game in town. It means that no other person uh, makes decisions than the parliament or than the elected representatives. And it will not happen. This is a certainty and uh, as such we can uh, count on it. We can also count on it that uh, Suu Kyi cannot become president uh, of the country. Uh, she may become eventually vice president, um, but uh, uh, her position will be much more difficult. No matter who becomes president of, of that country, 
that person must have military connections. It's written right there into the Constitution, which means then that uh, the next president will probably be um, an ex-general. And it's not just uh, the president, but it's also three of the top ministries. Um, they too must be, have military connections. Um, and so you can see that this, along with the requirement that one quarter of the seats within the assembly must be uh, military representatives, uh, things of this nature all mean that uh, no matter what happens in this election or who becomes president, uh, the military's position is pretty much secure. Now we are really looking at the real political struggle between NLD and the military. Before that, it's still on the propaganda level, but right now it's kind of fist to fist in the government. So very exciting, but also very uncertain. And that's it for us for now. We'll leave you with more from Myanmar. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.